so yeah guys yes guys so let's continue discussion so we were talking about companies accounting standards or india's accounting standards in uh, amendment rules 2022 which came up with effect from 1st april 22 it is effective and they are relevant for any person who was appearing for your ca final exams either in november 22 or subsequent attempts so those coming up with november 23s and may 24s also this particular topic is very much relevant for you because these indias are intact even in your new syllabus as well got it so please understand the relevance of what we are talking about right now now as we discuss there are about five changes which has occurred the first one is with respect to india 16 second one with respect to india 37 which is your provisions contingent assets and contingent liabilities third one with respect to india 101 and fourth one with respect to India's 109, which is your financial instruments. I know that's the most important standard for us. And let's understand what is the change in that as well. And lastly, the change occurred with respect to India's 41, which is with respect to agriculture, a small concept relating to tax is where it touches upon. Now, what are these changes and how did they affect your accounting standards? Now, these standards only with respect to certain paragraphs, there is a change. As such, the entire standard did not undergo a change. Let's understand, starting with respect to India 16, what is the impact which has occurred? The first one, with respect to India 16. Now, I hope everyone remembers India 16 because it happens to be one of the most important standards and the first standards as well. Right? So, one second, guys. I'll just turn back to that face. Yeah. So these are the changes. In all, about five changes that we have. And let's look at the first change in that with respect to India 16. One of the most important standards. You can call it as an alpha standard of assets. Now, when we talk about India 16, we did come up with a concept called as self-constructed assets, where the enterprise tries to build their own asset. In that particular context, we did discuss about something called as testing of an asset or commissioning of that particular asset. So you test the particular asset, commission the asset and see whether it is giving you a desired result or not. If it gives you a desired result, then the testing is successful and that testing cost is supposed to be added to the cost of the asset. However, if that commissioning or testing is failure, then the failed testing cost should be charged to PNL this much we've already discussed in India 16. But this inherent concept that will come up here is, let's say you have done a testing. For you to done, do a testing, there is certain amount of inputs that you have to give to the uh, asset and observe the output, whether it is the desired output that you want or not. Now, let's say the output as a, is as per desired. So what happens? The testing cost is capitalized to the cost of the asset. However, what about the output that has come up? These are the first set of output where before the commercial production has even commenced. Now, this output also has certain sale value. Yes, the company might decide to actually distribute them as samples. I'm not doubting that. But these are also going to have some market value. Let's say an enterprise, instead of distributing it as samples or keeping them as demonstrative pieces, but let's say the company has gone to an extent of actually disposing it or selling this output off. Now, this is an output out of testing phase where the capitalization of the asset has not been completed. You are still in the process of capitalizing. Once the successful output has come up, that is when you stop it. So this produce has come up exactly at the point when you stop the capitalization process. So this output here, which you have received, is coinciding with the exact date on which you stopped the capitalization process. So the proceeds which you got from the sale of this output, should it be credited to PNL or should it be reduced from the cost of the asset? Testing cost is added to the cost of the asset. So the proceeds from these, uh, the, from the testing produce, should it be reduced from the cost of the asset? Answer is yes, as per the clarification given under India 16. This is not an amendment, it's a clarification. 
It's a clarification to say that any sale proceeds that the enterprise derived out of disposing or selling its produce from the testing phase should be reduced from the cost of the asset. That is, I would say, arbitrary. Arbitrary, but the standard says you do it. India 16 is saying you can do it. But my question will always come up that it is coinciding exactly with the date on which you stopped the capitalization. You stopped capitalization when you saw the desired output. So the proceeds from this output, whether it should be credited to PNL or reduced from the cost of the asset, I think is debatable and very arbitrary. India 16 has taken a view saying that it can be reduced from the cost of the asset. However, it is significantly different from the treatment which is given as per India 6, IAS 16 or International Accounting Standards or your IFRS, your IAS 16, which is the corresponding standard, has been amended to say that these proceeds should be credited to PNL, should not be uh, reduced from the cost of the asset. However, your India 16 took a contrary view to reduce it from the cost of the asset. So this turns out to be also a difference between IAS 16 and India 16 now. Got it? So let's hope that even ICA amends this at a later point of time so that it is in harmony or in sync with the international reporting standards. But as of now, as it stands, the proceeds from the testing should be reduced from the cost of the asset and it tends to be a difference in accounting treatment when compared with the international accounting standard 16. This is a clarification given to India 16 under companies India's Amendment Rules 2022. Look at the next one. When you talk about India's 37, we did discuss about a concept called as onerous contracts. Do you remember this concept, onerous contract? What is an onerous contract? Where you understand that the cost incurred, the cost incurred to fulfill a particular contract is much higher than the benefit that I derive from the contract then it is called as onerous contract. I will have to incur 100 rupees to complete the contract, but I am expected to receive only 60. My cost of production is 100. My cost of uh, the expected sale proceeds from the item is only 80. So I am expected to derive a loss of 20 on this. And these contracts are basically called as onerous contracts. In days 37, in the context of executory contracts, say that executory contracts are exempted from India's 37 unless they are onerous in nature. So unless they are, they are resulting in an expected future loss. If they result in expected future loss, such expected future losses should be provided for immediately is what your India's 37 says with context to onerous contracts. Now what is he talking about with respect to onerous contracts right now? With respect to onerous contracts, he comes up with a statement saying that, read that statement, the first statement very carefully. As per the amendment made in 2022, both the incremental cost to fulfill the contract and allocation of directly attributable cost should be a part of cost used to determine the onerous contract. What are the two costs that he is talking about? Directly attributable cost and the cost which, are, which can be allocated or attributed to that particular contract. Now, directly attributable and directly attributed cost and reasonably allocated cost both to be considered as a part of onerous contract. Where he says, the asset which is dedicated to the contract, to the asset used to fulfilling the contract, these are the two assets which are also to be included in the cost. So therefore, the depreciation on that asset, the impairment on the asset, the revaluation of that particular asset, is also supposed to be included or supposed to be considered in computation of your onerous contract. So for example, let's say I've used an asset for a period of one year to fulfill a contract. The cost attributed to that particular contract is a directly attributable cost together with the depreciation for that year of this particular asset also to be included in the cost of onerous contract. Now, this is also considered as a clarification of the standard and not an amendment to the standard. So, what is he saying? The amendment requires you to take into consideration an imper impairment loss on all those assets whose cost will be considered in assessment of a contract is onerous. This amendment 
of including the impairment or depreciation on that particular asset to an onerous contract is only prospectively affected from 1st April 2022. So therefore, all the previous year's adjustments can be eliminated and if there is any onerous contract existing on 1st April 2022, the effect of that change, the effect of that particular change, the provision has to be increased. That increase in the value of onerous contract provision should be given to your retained earnings. To your retained earnings because it is a prospective effect from 1st April. This is in days 37 where we discuss about onerous contracts and it talks about assets which are utilized to fulfill that particular contract should also be attributed to the contract. So the depreciation, the impairment, the revaluation attributed to that particular asset should also be considered as a part of the cost in fulfilling the onerous contract. Now look at Indias 101. What is the impact of Indias 101 now? now? What is Indias 101 saying? It provides an exemption with respect to the first time. It's a first time adoption standard if you remember, right? Now what happens here is when you're first time adopting an Indias and especially when you talk about Indias 21, the effect of changes in foreign exchange rates, when this standard appears, you have to understand that whenever there is an effect of changes in foreign exchange rate which comes up, he says that as a first time adopter, there is an exemption provided to you. You can simply consider the entire exchange differences as a, a, you know, a deemed cost and you can change the same carrying values as existing on the date of adoption of India's can be considered as your values under India's as well. So I get to India's, there is no change because you have considered them as deemed cost. The same carrying value will be replicated once again. Clear? So this is fundamentally what happens. Now you need to understand that whenever you come up with these kind of strategies, this is no exemption not provided to the subsidiary. Now let's say the subsidiary adopts the Indias at a very later point of time. Now he says that even the subsidiary can use this exemption and make sure that the subsidiary need not revalue its assets as per Indias 21 they can continue to treat them as per the same rates or the same values as it appeared on the date of transition. This is the effect of India's 101. Again, this is a clarification which is given regarding the subsidiary because this paragraph was already applicable to the parent company, their joint ventures and their associates. Now it has further applied it to the subsidiary. These are provided in your mandatory exemptions of India's 101. Please check for it. What is India's 109 talking about? In India's 109, there is a concept called as extinguishment of a financial liability or a financial liability being de-recognized. Now, in such cases, sometimes there is a company which goes into a corporate debt restructuring. Under a corporate debt restructuring, what happens? Under a corporate debt restructuring, the old debt, the old debt is basically revised. The old debt is basically revised and made sure that it is replaced with the current debt, which happens generally when there is a stress asset. When there is a stress asset, it normally goes under this particular process where the old debt is replaced with the new, new debt. <clears throat> In such circumstances, should it be treated as a change or the previous financial liability or is it a new financial liability which has appeared, then the concept basically emerges here. Just a second. Yeah, excuse me about that. Yeah, so we were talking about India's 109 and I said, Sometimes when there is a CDR process or a corporate debt restructuring, that is where you come up with this particular concept. What happens in this particular concept is an enterprise which is under a stress, right? There are a lot of enterprises which do face stress, maybe due to their internal management issues or due to the external environment, whatever it is, whenever there's a stress, 
they can approach to the bank with a concept saying that I'm not able to actually repay your loan in the current repayment schedule. Can you please change the repayment schedule and give it to us? This just not happens only to the enterprises. Sometimes even a national debt of a particular company goes into a restructuring process. Very off late in 2022-23, we have seen Sri Lanka, which has offered a corporate debt restructuring process or a debt restructuring process for the entire uh, nation as a whole. This is a common phenomenon. Now, when you talk about this phenomena, what happens here is the new repayment schedule should be discounted to its present value to identify what is the fair value of the financial liability. The previous value of financial liability is already existing with you, which is being measured and recognized at its fair value. When you compare both of them, you will observe that there is a difference. 100% there will be a difference. Now, if this difference is in excess of 10% of the original financial liability, then you have to consider this particular change as a extinguishment or derecognition of the previous financial liability and this new change or a new financial liability should be considered as a new financial liability and not as an amendment to the previous financial liability. This is the concept that he has bought it. However, this concept has not undergone a change. It is only with respect to certain cost. To do a CDR, there are certain costs which are supposed to be incurred. The cost which is incurred can be with two forms. One, which the borrower or the corporate himself is incurring a certain cost, maybe in hiring a consultant, maybe in re-registering a particular mortgage. So all these, there are certain costs which the borrower pays. The borrower also pays to the bank CDR charges. Now these are costs which are incurred by the borrower. Now think from the lender's perspective or the banker's perspective. The banker also may, might have incurred certain amount of cost in completing this entire process. Regarding the treatment of this cost is the amendment which happened under India's 109. He says, while taking into consideration these costs or while taking into consideration this, the amendment clarifies that the fees paid, the fees paid for this purpose should include the amount paid by the borrower to or on behalf of the lender and the fees received includes a fees amount, uh, an amount paid by the lender to or on behalf of the borrower. Any amount which you paid to the borrower or on behalf of the borrower should be included in the cost. Sorry, any fees which you paid to the lender or on behalf of the lender should be included in the cost and any amount which is incurred by the banker, either to you he paid it or to the company he paid it or to the on behalf of the company he has paid it, that should be a reduction in the cost when you concept when you calculate this concept of 10% threshold. So it is substantially modified only when the net present value of cash flows in new terms, including any fees paid, net of any fees received. This theory of fees paid and net of fees received is exactly where the clarification has been given and has been inserted into India's 109. So what is he saying? When an enterprise goes into a CDR process or where the financial liabilities are restructured, then you need to look at what is the fair value of the new financial liability which has been agreed upon. Compared with the old financial liabilities which is existing in the balance sheet, compare these two and if the difference is in excess of 10%, please consider it as a new financial liability if it is a less than 10%, it should be treated as an adjustment to the existing financial liability. While calculating this threshold, the new financial liability measurement should be after including certain costs incurred by the borrower, net of the cost received by the borrower. Now, what is the cost incurred by the borrower? Any amount paid to the banker or on behalf of the banker. CDR charges paid to the banker. I registered a mortgage in favor of the banker. This is amount paid on behalf of the banker. Now, what is the amount, net of amount received from, uh, from the bank? Net of amount received is if, let's say, the bank paid something to the lender or the bank is paying on behalf of the borrower. Let's say there is a particular fees of mortgage. The borrower himself is saying, I can't pay it. So the lender says, okay, I will pay it on your behalf and let's register the mortgage once again. This is an amount incurred by the banker on behalf of the borrower, these have to be taken into consideration while you calculate the threshold. That is the third change in the standard. 
What is the sorry fourth change in the standard? The last one with respect to India is 41. That is agriculture. When you calculate agriculture, you have a particular paragraph called as 22, which says that certain cash flows should not be considered in measurement of fair value. And those cash flows are actually including income, your tax cash flows as well. Any tax cash flow should be excluded in measurement of fair value of a particular uh, uh, of of an agricultural asset. However, now there has been an amendment where he re removed this exemption. So that means even tax cash flows should be considered in measurement of a fair value of agriculture. Sir, agriculture tax makes an impact. Yes, absolutely, it makes an impact. I'll tell you how. Now, when you talk about for example, a direct agricultural produce, an agricultural produce in the form of milk, which is derived from a cow, that agricultural produce is exempted from taxation, right? Either income tax or your GST is exempting it. But if that particular milk undergoes a processing as a pasteurized milk being packeted and sold to the public at large, then it attracts GST on it. There is an element of income tax also which is levied on it. Therefore, the farm in which the agricultural produce is being sold does affect that particular taxation or that particular fair value of that particular item. Got it? That is the reason why he has included it and it is a very, very a thoughtful change that he has made to India's 41. In every aspect, you will observe this. Let's say, for example, for example, I'm saying you have produced certain amount of corn. That corn is an agricultural produce, you have harvested it tax-free. But from the corn, if you have actually extracted something and you made it into a corn cake, what happens is corn cakes are basically used as animal feed. That particular corn cake, which is produced out of the corn, which you have actually harvested, is attracting the taxation. Therefore, in measuring the fair value of the corn cake, tax has to be taken into consideration. That is the reason why he has made this. Out of those cash flows, the amendment made in 2022 deleted the cash flows of taxation from the exclusion list for measurement of fair value. This implies that tax cash flows must be included in fair value measurement of a biological asset which is measured as per India's 41. These are the five changes. India's 16, India's 37 with respect to your onerous contracts, 16 with respect to proceeds from testing, right? Uh, 37 with respect to onerous contracts, depreciation and impairment on assets used for that onerous contracts also should be considered as a part of onerous contract. In days 101, where we were talking about exemption, which is applicable to the subsidiary, where they can consider the book value as on the date of adoption of Indies also as a deemed cost under Indies. Exemption was earlier provided to the parent, joint venture and associate now extended or clarified that even for a subsidiary, I have done in days uh, transition myself, I would have given, take, I would have always taken it to the subsidiary as well. But though it was not explicitly given, now he has provided it clearly with respect to foreign currency changes. Got it? And the last two were basically in days 109 and in days 41. 109 where we discussed about extinguishment of a financial liability when there is a CDR process, the cost which is paid by the borrower on behalf of the lender or to the lender or paid by the lender to the borrower or on behalf of the borrower. These two costs should be considered in computation of your 10% threshold to identify whether the financial liability is extinguished or whether the financial liability is amended. Lastly, in days 41, where they started to include the tax cash flows as a part of measurement of fair value of biological assets under India's 41. These are the effective changes with respect to companies accounting standard amendment rules or India's amendment rules 2022, which came in with effect from 1st April 22. And these are applicable for exams after November 22. So those who are writing in May, uh, November 23 or May 24 or any subsequent attempts, even under new syllabus, these changes are very much applicable to you because these standards stand very much the same even under the new syllabus as well.